and a very warm welcome to our event today on global competition and digital change. How should we update European competition policy? Uh, this uh, event is very much a brainchild of our fellow Georgis Petropoulos, who has uh, been working in the last weeks very intensively to put this event together. And he will chair the second panel. Um, in the first panel, we discuss uh, state capitalism and subsidies. How can we ensure the level playing field in the internal market? Um, this has been, of course, a huge topic already in the, in the last couple of months. Um, I would say probably last one or two years, um, uh, especially in reaction to uh, China's rise and the very important role that China, the Chinese capitalist model plays and the changing nature of, um, of our economies due to digitalization. And so how this um, should lead to an adoption, not only in um, uh, or a strict enforcement of trade rules, but also in terms of um, competition and state aid rules. This is sort of the big topic that, that we want to discuss. Now, apparently, we are just still having some problems with the live stream. That's what I hear, um, <laughs> which is uh, really suboptimal because, um, the, uh, as you have seen, we, we have asked um, uh, out of precaution to, uh, to basically follow us on the live stream. Um, you know that um, the coronavirus issue um, is very much um, on all of our minds. Um, and I think I can also say that Martin Smith um, uh, is not here with us today because of uh, related constraints. Um, I'm not sure whether he will be eventually joining online. This I don't know, but, um, but we might, uh, might have to do the panel without him. And uh, my colleague Alicia Garcia Herrero, she's actually based in Hong Kong and she was scheduled to do from Hong Kong the intervention not to be here, here physically. Um, so so this, is, this is where we are, but we still have a stellar panel. Um, uh, and let me just quickly uh, welcome and introduce um, our panelists. So Luisa Santos is the Deputy Director at Business Europe. Thank you so much for coming and welcome. Uh, Christoph Schoser is the deputy head of unit at DG Competition in charge of this. Thank you for coming. And of course, Philip Steinberg, um, director general of economic policy at the German uh, Federal Ministry of Economic Affairs and Energy. Thank you for coming, Philip. So we want to uh, use this um, uh, event, uh, of course, to first hear your respective perspectives. Um, and then, of course, if you have questions, remarks, comments, I think we have enough um, uh, time to really um, hear from you and uh, engage in a debate also with you. Um, but before we come to the audience, let's um, really uh, start with uh, the presentations. And uh, Matilda, I'm just wondering, are we online now or? Yes, we are. We are being live streamed. Uh, this is great, uh, so, uh, so uh, welcome also to our online audience. And if I can say so, I mean, just uh, perhaps my one last word before I turn to the speakers. I mean, we also want to, in a sense, use the corona uh, virus uh, as an opportunity to innovate our events, right? And so um, uh, we've already had a few very small events, but we put it completely online, right? I mean, so we have it on Twitter, on Facebook, on all the social media as well as on the, on the web page. And we have huge amounts of people uh, actually watching and listening, um, uh, more than a thousand easily. So, so really, I mean, this is a great opportunity also to move um, events much more online, make it more interactive. And so I would hope also in, for the sake of our online audience, um, uh, let's make it very interactive here among us so that they find it even more interesting. Nevertheless, I think uh, they, they, you all have prepared um, uh, some interventions, and I think we, we should, uh, we should um, hear uh, uh, first your interventions and then have an interactive and lively debate. And um, uh, who, who, uh, who did we say would start? Um, um, Philip. Philip. Okay, perfect. Sorry, I, I missed that. So, Philip, you, um, <laughs> Philip you, uh, you have the first word. Thank you, Philip. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Gundram. Uh, thank you very much to all of you who are here online or, or here in the, in the room. 
Um, obviously, the topic is quite uh, quite relevant right now. I mean, it's good that we got some media coverage uh, in the Frankfurter Allgemeine Zeitung. There's a lot on about competition and industrial policy. Um, of course, um, the discussion is, uh, um, is, 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 is present in, uh, in the national and European um, um, uh, arenas. So, how can we ensure the level playing field in the, in the internal markets? I think my, my main message is um, that obviously um, we need um, a variety of instruments. There is, there is not one instrument which is actually uh, an instrument that will do the, the trick and will, will solve all problems. But what we really do need is a, is, a, is a toolbox. It's a toolbox of different instruments. And here, competition policy is one element. I mean, there are some who say competition policy doesn't, you don't have to do anything in this area, and I think that's wrong. However, on the other hand, after the siemens alstom case, there was a certain tendency that in the, in, 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 in the public debate, like, there was a lot of focus on competition policy and competition law. And that was, um, that was uh, too, much, uh, too much as well. So this, what, what, what does this toolbox need to, need to contain? I think, um, of course, um, what, we, what we need to be able to do, and that's, I think, I think a, a general question, I think a good starting point is still uh, the um, communication of, of the European Commission of, of 2019 where the Commission said, yes, of course, what do we want to achieve? We want to achieve open market. We want to maintain our multilateral trading system. And we want, of course, that the internal market is actively integrated into, into global value chains. But of course, we have those tendencies of increasing state capitalist actions, not only from China, of course, uh, but of course, most notably from, from China. And therefore, we need to be able to give a bold response, and we, we need to make sure that actually our message, this message, we want to open our market, we want an international um, uh, system, international free trade system, but that, that can, can be heard. And so, we need to update our toolbox. That means, yes, competition policy, and I start with competition policy, is one element. That means, of course, there has been a lot of change in the market definition, let's say. We never, and Peter Altmaier never wanted to always have global market definition as, as a starting point. The Commission has already, of course, changed its, its definition now, as I believe 70% or so of the market uh, definitions of the markets are global markets, but of course they don't always have to be global. That would be um, detrimental and, and, and contraproductive, um, uh, of course, because especially in the digital field, we of course need to have uh, more um, uh, uh, smaller markets and more um, more specialized uh, uh, markets. So, so market definition is is one element. Second element, the Commission is also working on. We are working on is of course cooperation. The eternal topic of cooperation, of course. How can companies cooperate under competition law? We will probably never reach like a satisfactory. Uh, um, a solution in the in the view of some some companies, but I think we of course we need to become better, and therefore it is good that we give clearer advice on what to do, how to how companies can can behave. In our our update of the German competition law, we are just we have uh, we are just uh, about to to pass in the in the cabinet. We will actually uh, give the companies on a procedural level more clarity, sooner clarity, if a corporation is okay under competition um, rules or, or, or not. So um, uh, cooperation is a second, uh, a second element. And then, of course, in view, and that is, now I've talked about the geopolitical uh, uh, challenges. Of course, uh, uh, the other big, huge, mega challenge, of course, is digitalization, as the, the title rightly suggests. And here, of course, we need to firstly um, enhance our anti-abuse provisions in order to be able to actually um, supervise the platform economy more effectively. And once again, we don't have a problem with big companies. We don't have a problem with, com with, with platform uh, companies. They can be efficient. They can, can be good for consumers. But of course, we have a problem with abuse of a dominant market position. And here, I think um, uh, we have one phenomenon, of course, that is the power of big 
uh, a big uh, platform, uh, platforms, and therefore we need to actually see if we need to go beyond this uh, this traditional um, ap approach and and include a provision um, for uh, how to deal with those um, structurally relevant platform, and and that's what we are about uh, about to do. So that was competition law, but then just very briefly, of course, there are other areas. Um, public procurement is an area. We have a reborn discussion on the international procurement instrument. Uh, uh, Germany has, uh, has, is, has slowly, let's say, uh, modified its, uh, uh, its position um, and we need to, to see if we can actually um, uh, adopt an instrument which of course needs to be practical, we need to be able to use it, and, um, but in order to, to, um, to uh, exercise some pressure in order to, to achieve this level playing field instruments. There is, of course, investment screening. We have updated our rules on investment screening, both nationally and, uh, and uh, on, the, on the European level. There are, of course, the traditional trade defense instruments, which, which um, is still uh, do, do play a role. So that was, that was one element which, which um, is, let's say, one can call it the defensive area instruments. Mm -hmm. And, of course, the other, the other um, uh, answer um, in order to, to create a level playing field uh, uh, instrument, of course, or to create a level playing field, is of course um, active policies, and there we need to of course um, um, uh, adopt a policy framework, where uh, the ensuring that Europe is still attractive. That's basically um, that's all. It's all of course it's our regula regulatory um, framework conditions. It's cutting red tape. It's uh, it's uh, creating and um, it, it's 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 boosting venture capital, um, and of course it's sometimes as well it's um, targeted industrial policy measures, um, like setting up this famous uh, European uh, projects of com uh, important projects of common European interest in certain areas we are working very closely with our, our French and Italian and, and many other uh, countries in order to set up IPCI in uh, concerning batteries concerning microelectronics uh, uh, con concerning hydrogen so so basically to sum up to sum up in order to um, to create a level playing field we really need toolbox and yes, we need some defensive instruments to, to tell our friends, hey, listen, we want open markets, but if you do the contrary, then we have, uh, we have some, uh, some uh, pressure, uh, po um, possibility to exercise some pressure. And then on the other hand, we need active policy measures, which are, let's say, more traditional to, to um, make Europe uh, attractive to, of course, um, uh, 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 enlarge the internal market or deepen the internal market, um, venture capital, all those, uh, those questions, and certain um, active industrial um, uh, policy, policy, policy instruments. I think if we create this toolbox, then I think uh, we are on the, on the right way to create a level playing field. Thank you very much. Thank you, Philip, for uh, for this uh, great overview. I mean, if you do, if you don't mind, I would like to push you a little bit to uh, perhaps be a bit more specific on one or two of those points, and perhaps tell us a bit more what Germany has already done. Um, I mean, you mentioned very prominently the pu public procurement um, instrument, and if you can just say a little bit more what exactly has been the decision and the debate, and where you see the debate going. And the other big thing uh, I think that I found very interesting is. Um, uh, on the on the digitalization, you you emphasize very much the anti-abuse um, uh, uh, provisions. Can you say a bit more what exactly uh, Germany specifically is doing there? Just to be a bit more specific for our audience. Of course, I mean on IPI, of course, the disclaimer is that this is an ongoing discussion. I mean, I mean we have the discussion in the in the working group and. Uh, and um, it's not clear that we that we attain a, um, a result. And of course, um, it's not we don't we don't say uh, we, we are sure that this will succeed. The, the question, of course, is the scope of application of this um, IPI, the International Public Procurement Instrument, because um, of course, and here we haven't changed our opinion. We need an instrument that is actually. Uh, that can be used. That is not too bureaucratic. That is uh, uh, that that uh, that uh, companies uh, uh, can live with. And so the main question is the scope of application. So which uh, and in what circumstances can you use it? The original proposition of the Commission was uh, was quite uh, quite complicated, uh, using percentage point, fifty percent of uh, of um, uh, content of. Uh, the countries which are actually closing uh, closing down their their public procurement uh, market. So now we we are exploring different 
of a different ways um, what um, in order to make that uh, that that simpler and more foreseeable because uh, of course and um, it's um, I mean if you look, go a little bit into it and, and, and look at subsidiaries and, and of course their value chains and interactions mm -hmm. and so on so that needs to be made, made, uh, made sure so that's just in, an, in a nutshell where we are um, and uh, the presidency has now asked uh, um, some some questions and and, and and we are exploring that um, I think there is some chance that we are that that we will, we will be successful but but it's not by no no means uh, sure yeah, but, but can, I, can I just ask so so if uh, that means on this public procurement point again uh, so it means if there is um, let's say um, a Chinese provider that is much cheaper than a European one but we have the feeling that this Chinese provider mm -hmm. or we can measure that this Chinese provider is actually heavily subsidized in China, then we can still turn down the cheaper offer and go for uh, a European product, um, even though it's higher costs for the taxpayers. I mean, mm. is that, is well, that I mean, I think understanding it? I mean, well, I mean, we have to, to, to make the distinction. I mean, now what you are mentioning is this level playing field instrument. Right. Um, right. That's actually not, it doesn't have exactly the same, um, the same um, scope of application. IPI is about reciprocity. IPI right. is about reciprocity. And the level playing field instrument, and thank you for mentioning it because I haven't, uh, uh, Mr. Schoser is certain, uh, certainly uh, uh, saying a few words on that. Um, the level playing field instrument is about state owned or subsidized companies which behave in a way which is anti competitive in Europe. But that's a different, different scope of application than the IPI, which is really about reciprocity, about uh, actually um, uh, um, uh, answering two countries which either in their Legal, because the legal framework is discriminatory, or because they behave um, behave uh, in a non reciprocal way, and of course our public procurement markets in Europe are the most open in the world, and there there we but what we want to achieve is a level playing field and reciprocity, and therefore it just we just have to make sure that we that the target we, we target it in, in a way which is uh, which is uh, proportionate and of course um, which uh, targets the right the right um, companies. So just very quickly on, on anti anti abuse um, uh, provision. That was your your, your second uh, second question. Um, I mean, here I think of course digitalization is is, is something uh, um, uh, very complex. We we talk a lot about data, we, uh, the relevance of data. So I think we make uh, and, and, and market definition. Of course, um, we need to make sure that uh, that market def the market definition exercise is something which uh, which can be can be done um, uh, quickly and in a, in a way uh, living up to the challenges of the data economy. And uh, there, I think, on the European level, on national levels, we have already achieved quite quite a bit. But for example, I think we still have to continue uh, with this exercise. In Germany, for example, we have something, and I think that's known uh, to many of you, something we call an essential facility doctrine, which is, of course, basically essential facilities used to be uh, the classical infrastructure um, uh, pr provisions. Now we include data as well to make to, to say that data can be an essential um, a facility. And then there's this big debate. We have tipping, we have many other, many other um, uh, elements which actually, I, th I would say, it's, it's, we, don't, we don't need necessarily new concepts, but we need to actually update concepts. And like, uh, I, th I like very much uh, uh, the uh, sentence of Andreas Mund, the president of our antitrust uh, um, uh, enforcement agency who said, yeah, of course, under the, under, because many say we don't need an update. We can do everything under the, under the current, uh, current in, in within the current framework. And in a way, that's true. But Andreas uh, said, well, yeah, that is may. But if, if it takes us two years to determine that markets don't necessarily need to have, a, to, have a, a, to be related to, to money, or I mean, then, then actually we need to become quicker. And then the second question is, apart from updating the current framework, then it's a question, do we need to go a little bit beyond? And that is in our framework, or in our proposition, to update our, our um, uh, antitrust law. Um, we are including, we are about to include something I, I like to, to, uh, to, to call, call, um, call it's, it's, it's not regulatory law, of course, it's still comp competition law, but it's um, um, Kartellregulierungsrecht, regulatory law within a competition law framework. And that is about big structurally relevant platforms where we say, okay, we actually, we, um, we don't need all the, um, uh, to, 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 to follow the traditional market definition um, uh, 
approach, but we can actually define those platforms and then be more, be quicker and act quicker in order to um, uh, uh, to to uh, to uh, tell them what to do and what not to do. Okay, thank you, thank you, Philip. So clear call for an update of our framework. Um, the Commission um, uh, is here represented, Christoph. Um, uh, where, where, where do you see um, uh, the EU uh, at the moment in this, in this respect? Yes, uh, thank you, Guntram. Um, I think I can echo uh, very much uh, of what uh, Philip said in the beginning. Um, we've, um, well, we're concerned about the level playing field, um, about uh, more generally competition in the internal market. And we have uh, seen there may be a gap in the regulatory framework to ensure this uh, level playing field. In particular, there is a sophisticated system of state aid control within the EU. So whenever, obviously, member states give uh, subsidies that is uh, controlled and uh, surveyed uh, according to a large number of criteria, uh, but there is nothing similar with respect to foreign subsidies. Um, so foreign governments in some way or another, and there can be different forms uh, of aid in different circumstances that are given to companies uh, then that have an effect on the internal market. Um, we already have a large toolbox um, of competition instruments, and I will not repeat uh, what, what Philip said of competition um, tools, the state of control, merger control obviously also is a tool to control uh, foreign investment in the EU to, to some extent um, and of the trade instruments um, but this, there is no specific control yet of um, foreign subsidies that have an impact uh, on the EU. Um, we, those can be take, take place, as I said, in the context of acquisitions, um, but also in other forms. They can be giving loans uh, at zero interest rate, for example. It can take the form of capital injections, um, of, of grants, uh, which is the most uh, obvious form of giving an aid. Um, but I think that that's what we're looking at at the moment and what we later this year want to also uh, test with the market participants and stakeholders to see what kind of um, potential problems uh, there are from uh, foreign subsidies. Um, the, the process uh, that we are following it, it was launched, uh, as said before, by the EU-China communication about a year ago. And now with the new commission, it's clearly become one of the policy priorities to look into the question of the of level playing field and to investigate the, the effects of foreign subsidies and foreign state ownership on the internal market. Um, the concrete uh, planning is to have a white paper in the next quarter uh, where we will propose, I would say, ideas and options um, so it will that will be there to test the market, consult the market, see what stakeholders, member states, and uh, everyone concerned uh, thinks about these ideas. So we will put a number of options and ideas on the table. And um, from that, we will see uh, which way to go. I, I think, uh, maybe already to conclude, we, are, we don't uh, want to block any still welcome foreign investment into the EU. Um, there is a huge amount of foreign investment into the EU and I think we, we think it's certainly welcome. It's part of uh, the global economy and very much to the benefit of the EU that there's a lot of investment into the EU. So while developing this tool, we are very much aware that we don't want to block uh, any of such investment. Uh, at the same time, uh, as I try to uh, point out uh, there may be some concerns with respect to distorted investment signals basically um, or distorted market behavior coming from from foreign subsidies uh, from uh, third countries um, thank you very much Christoph could you just say a few words about um, uh, the change in the market definition that is being discussed and whether um, the current way we define markets is appropriate or whether it should be more global and uh, also react a bit to what Philip said that 
perhaps in the digital space, markets are smaller, I think that's what you said, which I actually found a bit surprising, um, or can be smaller. Can you, can you just say a bit about uh, definition of market, because that's such an important criterion, and how is the thinking within the Commission evolving on this? Um, I think there the reflections are at an early stage. I think I, I cannot say much uh, about this. I mean, the Commissioner has uh, agreed now to look into this, uh, 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 into the redefinition, potential redefinition of markets, but I think it's, it's too early to say in which direction this is going to go. Okay, um, now let's turn to uh, Luisa Santos, uh, Deputy Director from Business Europe, uh, to get a company perspective. And afterwards we will have Alicia Garcia Herrero from Hong Kong uh, giving us a view from the yellow or red zone. Thank you very much. Um, so already a lot has been said, but maybe to come back to the context and uh, why the issue is important for business. I'm sure many of you have seen that we have published in January this paper. It's called The EU and China Addressing the Systemic Challenge. We have here 130 recommendations. We have here, these recommendations also include competition. Why? Because dealing with China is not easy. It's a very complex exercise, actually. So why now, uh, why are we having now all these discussions about competition, but also about leveling playing field, and why this is important for business? Well, the issue is that we thought that when China joined the WTO in 2000, China would eventually become a market economy or closer to a market economy. And at that one point, China was doing the necessary reforms for this to happen. But this has changed. Uh, we have seen with President Xi Jinping that actually the process of reform has gone back. So instead of becoming a market economy, China is becoming a much more state-centric driven economy. The increased role of the state in the economy is creating a lot of problems and a lot of market distortions. And this is not only in China, because that was the initial problem. Initially, it was in China. So our companies, when they wanted to invest in China, when they wanted to sell in China, they faced the problem that you have an economy that is not functioning according to a market economy. But now the problem is going everywhere around the world. It's happening here in Europe. It's happening in third markets. Why? Well, because we have seen that the Chinese government intends to create Chinese champions, which of course per se is not a problem. The thing is how it is, this process is being done. It's being done independently of what the market needs and what are the market realities is being done by injecting a number of subsidies, and you were already mentioning, by providing loans or export uh, subsidies. And this, of course, leads these companies to uh, create a number of distortions that range from public procurement, competition, investment, and of course, trade. So we are our companies that have to face, for instance, specific regulations when it comes to subsidies. We follow OECD rules. So we know that we, when we receive a subsidy or a loan, we have to follow certain rules. In the case of the EU, we have very strict state aid rules. And we also are guided by OECD when it comes to uh, loans. But this is not the case for Chinese companies. Of course, they have access to very cheap money. That's why they can invest even in areas or in companies that they know from the start are not profitable. But they will do so for strategic reasons. And they are using, for instance, vehicles like the Belt and Road Initiative precisely to promote this strategy across the world. So the problem is becoming really a very, very difficult issue. And I wanted to 
give you this overall perspective because we should not focus only on the EU market. EU market is important, that's why we're talking about competition, but the problem is spreading all over the world. And we are being squeezed as European companies because we, of course, follow the rules. So we would like to have a more balanced relation with China. And we can do this bilaterally. I mean, we already talked about the investment. We are discussing with China to conclude a comprehensive agreement on investment. This agreement should also include rules on state-owned enterprises, on foreign subsidies, also on forced technology transfer. That's a very important area as well, talking about digital, for instance. But we also think, and this is part of what was already discussed, we also think that the EU needs to uh, have better tools to address this new reality. This means, of course, that we need to ensure we have a more competitive environment for our companies. We don't want to close the European market. We want Europe to continue to be open for investments, open for trade. That's clear, because we also want other markets to open more for our companies. We don't want to leave China. We want to remain engaged in China. But we want China to be as open as we are today. So how can we, within the European perspective, and besides the bilateral discussions we have with China, and also what we can do trilaterally, you know that we are discussing with US, Japan, how to improve the toolbox when it comes to foreign subsidies, when it comes to industrial subsidies in the WTO. This is a long-term initiative, but we hope eventually to lead to better disciplines also in this area. But as I said, it's long-term. So in the meantime, what we should do? Well, one of the areas where we think we need to, uh, to get uh, a better market um, conditions for our European companies is definitely when it comes to competition. Uh, we <laughs> My microphone is moving. Uh, <laughs> so we welcome, of course, uh, this idea of um, better understanding or better defining the market or the relevant market. Because it is a fact, and we see this again, I don't want to, to, this to be a China bashing, but it's very much in the, in the, in the light of the China uh, situation. In many cases, we don't have yet a competition on the European market of a certain company, but this competition is being created in China. And it's very easy to see it. You all know that China has a strategy. China manufacturing 2025, where you clearly see already which sectors China is betting, which sectors China wants their companies to be global players. And just now we heard some, some news about chip building. It's in our paper. It's clearly one of the sectors where we are seeing the Chinese government backtracking. So China at one point split the two companies in this area, chip building. Now, what did he do? it decided to bring them back again and create a merger to create a big company that can compete with Europe and other partners, South Korea, for instance, in the world. So this is a concrete example that maybe now you don't have direct competition, but you will have it in the future. So I think we need to be a bit more proactive and a bit more flexible when we interpret this idea of relevant market. The other aspect that we need to see in terms of competition, it was already mentioned, we are very much promoting when it comes to research and innovation. This is definitely one of the areas where Business Europe is promoting that and is asking for more to be done at European level, including an additional uh, uh, budget for uh, research and innovation. We need to make sure that we have the right framework to allow for cooperative and collaborative research. The whole idea of creating consortia is very important and we need to make sure that competition rules and state-head rules also take this into account. The same goes for the projects of key strategic interests for Europe. Do the rules today in terms of competition are really, really the best to uh, promote these projects. We think also here we need, we need something to, to be done. So I think that uh, 
I would like to 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 stay here. I, of course, maybe just one two two final points. Uh, because they were mentioned already before on the procurement. As I said, it's also an area where we see a clear problem. Uh, we see a problem in Europe, the abnormally low tenders. That's clearly one issue, but not the only one. The fact is we have uh, rules when it comes to fulfilling certain environmental or social conditions, but we also know that sometimes these rules are not being applied by the authorities, and this is something we should improve. But we are definitely looking also as European business of regarding the IPI, the International Procurement Instrument. I have to say as Business Europe, we are in the process of finalizing our position. As well as the German government, uh, our members have gone a long way. And we understand now that the instrument is actually needed. Uh, we are not totally in agreeing with what the, the, the Commission is proposing is in, in this 2016 proposal, so we will ask for some improvements, but we think we need this instrument now. We are also asking, by the way, in our China paper regarding the FDI screening, that ideally all countries in the European Union should have a system. We know that for the moment half have, the other half doesn't have. Um, for us, it's important that if we really want a good monitoring of what is happening in terms of investments in Europe, uh, every country should, should have a, a, a system in place. So, these were my initial remarks. I hope it was not too long. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Luisa. This was very clear. And per perhaps also to, uh, to push you a little bit, I mean, you talk quite a bit about the defensive side of the instruments. Mm -hmm. I mean, so we need defensive instruments, China is moving up, and we need to protect our industry. Okay, but I mean, uh, shouldn't we talk much more about the proactive instruments? I mean, the fact that China moves up the value chain, the fact that China has a strategy, we also used to have a strategy, right? I mean, and many of our big companies um, are old companies, but when they were founded, guess what? The state was, of course, important at the, at, the, at the time, be that in terms of the basic research, be that in terms of the framework they provided in the 50s and so on after the war, I mean, or even pre-war, World mm -hmm. War II, right? I mean, the, many of our big companies, they are, they are they're actually just quite old, and at the time when they were founded, they were actually founded in a very clear framework where the state played an important role, right? And so... So now we are talking about, oh, let's protect, uh, let's protect ThyssenKrupp, let's protect um, mm -hmm. uh, BASF, and so on and so forth. These are great companies, mm -hmm. but they are relatively old companies. So what, what about the new uh, ecosystem for new companies? I mean, we are not going to win the race against China by protecting ourselves. I mean, this is not going to be enough. Can you say a bit more on the, mm -hmm. on the active side? No, of course. I mean, the idea is not to create Fortress Europe. Uh, but the idea is that we need to be pragmatic also. Um, we need, of course, to have means to increase our market access to China. And this is what we are doing in our bilateral negotiations on investment. That also includes uh, the main, the central part is improve our market access. Our companies cannot invest in every sector in China. They cannot have 51% of a company if they want to. Well, there's one exception actually that was made for a, a, a German company, but that's one exception. The rules do not allow 51%. So if you want to be a majority partner in China, you cannot. So we want this to improve. So we want our companies to be able to access better to the Chinese market. And this is a very offensive interest of the EU. We are also asking, that's why we, we have 130 recommendations, because we are not only talking about protecting the EU market, no. And we are not, I would not like to talk about protection, I would like to talk about rebalancing the market, the situation in the market. We are also asking for the EU to be a bit more proactive when it comes to research and innovation, for instance. Do we want our companies to be better in this area? Of course we do. But we, for instance, are very critical about this idea of creating champions. I mean, it should not be the government or it should not be the rules to create these champions. But this is precisely what China is doing. When China is established that I want to have, I want my companies, I want my production 
to be 80% or 90% of the market by 2020 or 2025, I am actually determining the market myself. So this is what we don't want. And by the way, this is not in the traditional sectors. I mean, we know that we have overcapacity in steel and aluminium. We know that we are, China is creating overcapacity in semiconductors, for instance, but we will see this more and more in electric vehicles, for instance, or in other artificial intelligence or in other areas. So this is something that will spread and we need to be very conscious of it. And I think that's why without being protectionist, we also need to be very pragmatic and not to continue to say, okay, I'm okay if the Chinese have access to my market uh, and I cannot have access to their markets. It's okay if Chinese uh, companies benefit from uh, loans, from uh, state head, and we do nothing. So we are very much, by the way, looking at what the Commission will propose in terms of foreign subsidies, because this is really a problem. It's a problem because it's allowing Chinese companies to by European companies without having to respect the same conditions as we Europeans if we want to buy a company in Europe. Thank you. So that's perhaps a good moment to bring in uh, Alicia. Alicia, uh, thank you for, uh, for making time uh, from, uh, from Hong Kong and uh, it's good to have you here, uh, not physically actually, but uh, uh, through, uh, through, uh, through, the, um, um, uh, through Zoom. Um, it just, um, I mean, you've, you've listened attentively, and I think um, one of the things I certainly remarked is that there's still a lot of hope that China will, will change, right? I mean, we want China to open up, right? I mean, I've heard this discourse, I think, for at least 10 years, um, and it, it hasn't happened, uh, at least not to the extent we want to. And you've looked, of course, at um, uh, basically um, China's investment here, but also the other way around. So, so why don't you give us your take on this, please? Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, good. Yeah, good. Okay. So, so uh, first of all, I mean, it's hard to add to the discussion because it's been, frankly, uh, very complete and very comprehensive. And it's and you know, um, Lisa has touched on China so much. So I'm going to try my best to add some ideas. Uh, because of the Zoom issue, and I know it's hard to follow. It's hard to follow. I guess I would start by saying that, say, um, probably once upon a time, and certainly not this fifth generation of leaders in China, there was time where China was into China was whether meaningfully or not, I won't judge, but introduced something like introduced the monopoly law in 2007. Um, you know, it tried to introduce, tried to have competition within its market, not necessarily for foreigners. I, I fully agree that markets haven't closed fully now. They've been closed for a long time. Either you were operating with a JV or you wouldn't get in, into the Chinese market. We all know that. But, but in a way, within Chinese uh, companies, uh, trying to give, give trends of excessive uh, concentration, market concentration being negative. That was the negative. Uh, and I fully agree with the fact that we've been reverting this idea uh, since 2015 in particular. Well, the, the shipping thing was slightly before, I think 2014. We've seen railways, we've seen shipping, we've seen many, many sectors. Basically, China has been moving towards more concentration. And this is not related to us only. I mean, the question is why this has happened. I think partially, and this is uh, Xi Jinping's concept of um, uh, state on ownership uh, reform, what they, which was all about um, basically reducing inefficiencies. And the idea was that by merging companies, you would reduce part of that, uh, you know, that, that excess um, the reality is that ex that basically overcapacity has been only reduced in the good times through additional stimulus 2016 February 2016 onwards, but it's never been the case never been a rationalization massive rationalization of state-owned companies in China. So in a way, it's like having a hot potato, if I may say. I mean, you know that 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 overcapacity is pressing your 
prices down, so China has suffered. Once and again, uh, 2015 was extreme. Producer price index was minus six, and you know, they were getting back uh, to that level. This was before coronavirus. Already, you know, back to that overcapacity. We had heard uh, in, rightly so about electric vehicles. We had already solar panels before. I mean, there's many quote unquote new sectors also affected by uh, excess capacity. So, so in a way, it's a model that produces excess capacity. In that regard, although you may try to rationalize that through mergers and try to, you know, the reality is that this is very difficult because employment needs to be kept alive, etc. So in a way, it's a model that exhausts itself. It's just that we've not seen it happening. So we fear because we just can't believe that this, you know, that we see the negative on our side, but we don't know when this is going to end because in our rational behavior, thinking this is unsustainable. Now, if it is unsustainable, and we have had Puntra and I this discussion many times, you know, they want to subsidize our consumers. Why not? If it's unsustainable, is their problem? You know, we've heard this many times. Now, it so happens that this ar argument, in my opinion, may be true in the long run. If, if you look at the fiscal uh, uh, viability of China's um, expenditure, I think it's impossible because and the coronavirus, in a way, shows this. Health uh, expenditure has been flat for years, but you know, econ what they call economic affairs, which is basically subsidies, of course, military. What that's a different topic. I mean, all of that has been growing to the point that we now have uh, a consolidated fiscal deficit in fiscal that, in my opinion, could well hit ten percent this year. I mean, it's been close to eight percent in two thousand eighteen. Those are the last. We have because you need to consolidate local governments, and it's pretty difficult. Those deficits are off balance sheet. But to, my point here is that it's basically, in terms of fiscal costs, hard to maintain for a country that will, for a country that will need more aging for health, etc. So in a way, we could argue, well, you know, this problem will be solved eventually once. China realizes it can't afford it. But I always come to the point that in some sectors, though, there may be massive lock in effect, economies of scale. I mean, scale, yeah. I mean, stuff that basically makes you get the market, get the market and then, and then maybe, ramp up, maybe prices, ramp up prices if you need a margin. A margin you know, how can we assess, can we assess whether, whether some, some of these, these uh, protection, protection if, if I may use that. Chinese that word that getting that getting on the global sphere, I can't agree more, will then, will then lock, lock those companies into basically capturing the market. That. And I think that's the key question mark. That's a key question mark. Because if it's too much about, you know, what we all kind of have lived in for many years, in perfect competition and so on, competition speaking, at some point in time, this will be unsustainable. But we don't really know. We don't really know. All of those new sectors are indeed as indeed you know, perfect, you know, perfect uh, as sectors as we would be hoping for. So that's that's I think the key issue. Um, so perhaps so, um, I would add a little bit of a story on the fact that we're not alone in this zone in discussion. So yes, we can have wonderful discussions on our BIT. Uh, with China, but China is also locked, if I may say, by its discussions with the U.S. And those discussions, and those at least partially, have been finalized. Phase one deal. We have seen it in the data. This is data, but I can imagine what this means for what this. We've seen it in the we've seen it in the in the data trade data, 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 data. So basically, very very, very very imports have fallen very little minus five given what's happening. I mean exports have collapsed and so on. When you look at US data, US data, they're doing fine. So so what we so was that China is trying trying to um, comply with at least partially what has been partially to the US. If you think about, com about com and it's a problem for and it's a problem for us. Um, um, but, but 
the other issue, though, is that this can be applied to competition. I mean, how can we ensure that if the U.S. has not managed to get to any kind of agreement on subsidies, we're going to do that with our BIT? So this just to bring me to the final point of should we, in a way, abandon that expectation that we will manage to get something um, tangible from China as regards SOEs, and I want to clarify, and this is a paper we wrote a while ago, but I think this still holds true for Bruegel, is not only SOEs, any strategic company, Huawei being an example, but there are many others, can act as SOEs in terms of, you know, uh, basically protection from the state. So in that regard, uh, or think about Midea buying, you know, KUKA. I mean, this, this wasn't even a company in that sector. How can do that? How could media do that? I mean, media and private company again. So, so I just think that we have to forget only about labels, it's just about support. But then, how can we enforce? Final point I was trying to make is how can we enforce we Europeans uh, something that the US didn't manage to do? So, should we move in a different direction? Should we move towards maybe like a multilateral push for China to join the OECD, for example. I mean, kind of push China to, to, to sorry to say push China, but I mean, since we're talking very frankly here, I mean, rather than, than in, a, in a bilateral discussion, where, by the way, there's many parts, because many, many countries in Europe have high-level economic dialogues with China, let's be frank, you know, how can we given the mess, if, to put it bluntly, do that. So maybe we need to recognize that before these negotiations uh, end in whatever way and, and think of, of a more multilateral approach. Uh, the WTO, I'm sorry to say, I don't think it's enough for what we are looking for here because a lot of the, of the um, issues uh, go beyond trade, clearly go beyond trade. Uh, and the minute you have a dysfunctional market in the largest, basically, PPPY, the largest economy in the world, with as many Fortune 500 as the US at the moment, you just can't only talk about dumping or, you know, like it's just not enough. So I think you need to move China towards those uh, remaining, maybe not fully enforceable international regulations which deal with these issues and i can only think of the oecd at the current juncture it might not be enough but i think we we need to try um to do that um and perhaps think of a different form of coordination beyond the g20 which is probably too crowded to have this discussion and in which china can find also many supporters of similar or increasingly similar economic models. Think about India, think about Russia, etc. So, you know, basically our territory. I don't think G20 is our territory in that regard. So, so I guess a different strategy uh, to deal with this issue other than, which I can understand where we're coming from, but other than only, I would say only uh, defending ourselves. I think we need to basically also push China towards the existing rules of the game and not only play on our defensive our defensive because if play defensive might work if China's fiscal you know collapses I don't think that's a good thing for the world either so it's not a solution anyway so so I think this is the way, uh, because if not, the only viable dialogue, sorry to say, will be with the US and will be really in a corner at this juncture. So I just leave it here. I hope this is helpful. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, that was very clear. And I think also it raises really a couple of fundamental points that are really uh, sort of at the core of the issue. And uh, I mean, if I may just echo perhaps some of them, I, I think one, one question you raised is, um, and I think it's an important question, is that China is, of course, um, not just sort of one thing. It's a very complex and fast-evolving market, and um, there are parts of the Chinese economy that are extremely competitive, right, and where competition enforcement is actually tough and where there's just a lot of competition for uh, being the best. Um, and then there's some where this is not the case and where the state apparently has a strategy and has strong um, intervention and a strong um, 
uh, companies that it uh, it makes very big. Now, then the question is, when you have those kind of companies, um, to what extent is that um, is that a problem for the for the world economy, right, and for our, for our our companies and and our long term, uh, let's say, um, uh, sustainability and. I think uh, the, the one point you made very strongly is, I mean, there's some sectors where concentration um, in the long term basically means massive state subsidization, and that subs it means subsidization of European consumers. And so, so in that sense, there, the welfare, the, I mean, the implications for companies may be negative, but the welfare implications for Europe might actually still be positive, right? Because um, you get subsidized steel. That's great, right? I mean, I get, ch I get cheaper steel than before. Um, but it becomes a problem in sectors where there are really massive lock-in effects. And I think in the digital space, this is probably much more relevant. I mean, you have some sectors where uh, it's, you really get, get lock-in effects um, and the winner takes all, and then it's very difficult to break uh, afterwards, break... Um, break uh, these companies and enter with new companies. And, and so, so perhaps, um, uh, Luisa, I know that you want to react to this, but I, I also actually want Philip to, to react to this, um, uh, just to get your perspectives on, on, I think this is a very fundamental point, right? I mean, how do we, de because our solution to the Chinese problem cannot be that we give up on free markets, right? I mean, because I mean, this is sort of the extreme, and I hear that sometimes. Uh, no, we cannot and we should not, and I think all the evidence we have is that weaker competition enforcement is not good for innovation and it's also not good for consumers, right? I mean, for both we know it's actually a bad thing to have massively weaker competition enforcement. We know this from the very nice book by Thomas Philippon, who compares the US and Europe and shows how much more uh, European, uh, uh, how much less uh, European company uh, consumers pay for their products than what American um, consumers pay. And that is, in that sense, not a desirable welfare outcome that we just reduce our own competition enforcement. So, so we need to be very careful and I think also very nuanced and focus on the kind of sectors, it seems to me, that where lock-in effects and long-term past dependency can be, can be uh, sort of uh, very, very big and very important. But I don't know if, if you agree. I mean, I would love to hear you, Luisa, and then Philip. Thanks. Uh, thanks, Alicia. I mean, uh, very, very interesting perspective. Um, of course, dealing with China cannot be only one action. You need to, you need to work in different fronts, and, and that's the reality. I mean, we cannot only work on getting Europe more competitive or in improving our procurement markets, our competition rules, even our trade defense rules. Uh, that's one angle. The other angle is, of course, the bilateral angle. Um, and you mentioned uh, the, if we will be able to get a better deal with China than the U.S. did. Um, actually, this is, this is a very interesting question. And this is the thing we are, this is one question we are posing to our Chinese colleagues. Do, what do you prefer? You prefer the European approach, that is more of a diplomatic one through negotiation, or you prefer the US approach that's basically bullying you, putting additional duties on you uh, as a way of acting. And this will depend a lot on what China will do now. If in the end, China is able to give us more on our bilateral relation than what China gave to the US, we got an answer. And we are ready as European business to support this comprehensive agreement on investment. If in the end, what China puts on the table is basically what they have given already to the US or even less, uh, well, I think we should say no. We know that we have a deadline of this year to conclude these negotiations, uh, but for us, it's important that we get this right. We don't want to lock in existing asymmetries. I mean, if this agreement is to basically recognize the status quo, this is something we're not happy with. So we need to be very clear. If China decides simply to say, well, I'm not giving you more to, you, to Europe because I actually even admit that the US methodology is more effective, well, I think then we, we need also as Europeans to, to, to assess once again our relation with China. It's also one of the reasons why we keep saying to the US, very difficult to, to convince them, 
that we should be working together when it comes to China. Unfortunately, the US still thinks that it can address its relation with China and the massive distortion that China is creating around the world unilaterally by using its own tools and not cooperating with Europe. Um, I totally agree we should try to work uh, multilaterally or plurilaterally, and this is what we are doing together with US on subsidies, but we need to enlarge this front. OECD definitely, especially when it comes to, to finance, uh, but also other areas. Th that's why it's not only one approach. We should act on all fronts. This is not easy because we Europeans tend to concentrate only one. We are a bit focused on one thing and forget all the rest. No, we need to work to, to get China to put pressure because I think that um, this is important. We need to, we need to work on, on different fronts. My last point is you mentioned consumers. Uh, it's very good for consumers, yes. But I think also this whole uh, situation that we are facing right now about the virus is also you know, raising our conscience that we need in some areas to have alternative sources. We cannot be so dependent on a country like China or whatever country. So, because if we have an issue, and we had already one issue uh, on raw materials, if you remember some years ago, where China basically stopped access to some of the critical minerals that we need for the new uh, technology and the new uh, innovative areas. So we definitely need to uh, also be as part of our increased leverage and increased competition is trying to find alternative sources in a number of areas, including on, on critical minerals. In a sense, reduce um, a bit the international division of labor and um, reduce value chains and deglobalize a little bit. Is, is, is that the name of the game nowadays? I would not say deglobalize. I would say um, find alternatives. Uh, globalize. Globalization would always be there. The question that we have today, and it's not just the coronavirus, is also what the US is doing uh, with China. I mean, you have seen a lot of regulation that is being uh, happening sometimes under the radar. For instance, when it comes to dual use goods and export controls, a number of bans the US is imposing on exports of sun technology to China. I mean, this will definitely have an impact on supply chains. Our companies are active in the US, they're active in China, they're active in Europe and active around the world. If we have one of the major players start creating, you know, limitations to exports or imports, of course companies will need to readjust their value chains. Do I need to be more regional and do a value chain for China, one for the US and Europe? I mean, this, if we continue the current trend, will definitely be one of the options, not because companies want to, but because they will be forced to. Okay, I let Philip react, and then, of course, I take questions from the audience. So if you could already think of what you want to ask, please, Philip. Yeah, uh, very quickly, uh, three points on, on China. I mean, there, of course, there's this question, do we need to be afraid of China? That was kind of the, 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 the debate we had. Or there are some economists, especially, who say, we need to care for China, actually. We need to help China, because, um, because of course, investment uh, share of 45% is not sustainable. Of course, the high debt, implicit and explicit, uh, um, is, is not sustainable. Um, the only problem is, I mean, I hear that. We have been hearing that for 20 years already now, and still, in kind of, uh, you know, in a way, it's it's still um, it's, it's still sustainable. So I'm I'm a little bit uh, Clemens Fuchs is always saying that you know we need to help China. I mean, it's not going to be sustainable. I'm not so sure about that. Second point, of course, the big debate. I mean, is is. Yes, China is a developing country, of course, an emerging country um, in, in many, many areas. Still, um, the, the, the markets we are competing uh, with China, of course, there they are very much developed. And therefore, I mean, I think it's, it's, it, we cannot just say, of course, if you look at GDP, um, 8,000 US dollars or so, and it's a quarter of, 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 of the German GDP. Um, it's still, I mean, I think we need to focus on, on the relevant uh, sectors. And I think there, of course, in certain sectors, we do see, see um, that China is, is a world leader or, um, uh, or, or even, even, even beyond uh, that. And then third, on, on, on the successes of, of our policies, of course, offensive and defensive policies. Mm -hmm. um, I mean, obviously, 
I mean, that we are still in the process. I mean, it's too early to, to make a judgment. Still, I would argue, being, being an optimist, um, um, I would say we do see certain, uh, certain successes. I mean, uh, China has enacted a new, new foreign investment uh, law, even though my colleagues uh, and experts say, okay, on the, on the, on the headlines, it's, it's openness, but if you look at the, in, in, in the, into the doing, it's not, um, it's not there where we, we want it to be, but still, it's, it, it's a step. We do... Um, China has um, presented a new offer to, uh, for, to adhere to the G uh, GPA, to the General Pub uh, Procurement Agreement. Um, it's not there where we want it to be, but still it, it's, it's, a, it's a big improvement. Um, and, and so I think we do see, we, we do see um, certain steps, um, and therefore I would argue this, this uh, policy is, um, is, is, is successful. Um, and, and therefore, yes, once again, we need this, this toolbox, and this toolbox of Let's, and we are talking about competition law, amongst other things. Um, um, and we, we need these two elements. I mean, we, had, we have really these two pillars why we need to update our competition policy framework. First, it's, it's digitalization. And listen, I mean, it, um, in Europe, market capitalization of European platforms is 3%. Of, of market capitalization. And we are always talking about GAFRAM. Yes, GAFRAM is, is today, it's, it's 66%. But Asia is already 28%. It's not only China, of course, it's South Korea as well, Samsung. But still, I think, um, therefore, it's, uh, it's, it's too narrow if you only concentrate on, on, on GAFRAM. Uh, there is a real challenge as well, uh, going beyond the traditional industrial policy debate we are, we are very much concentrating um, uh, on now. But still, of course, yes, the traditional industrial policy um, debate is relevant as well. Therefore, we need a really a very, uh, very um, subtle update of our market definition, guidelines, we don't ask for anything more, you know, but the guidelines are date from 1997, I think after more than 20 years it's fair enough to have an update, um, things have changed, and we know we don't want industrial policy to be immersed into competition law, we are not talking, if you talk about sh champions, about European champions, it's not only big companies, we have a lot of hidden champions everywhere, and we want to generate them, but of course we do need to have a, have a comprehensive view, it's really, it's, it's too simplistic, if you say everything can change, can remain as it is, as much as it is too simplistic, if you say, oh yeah, we want to have the, the old industrial policy back and the competition policy needs to, uh, that's, that's the main, main driver of competition policy. Okay, great. Uh, let's take a few questions from, uh, from the audience. And I see uh, Julia and Georgios and uh, the gentleman there in the back, uh, Julia. Julia? Um, How would you like to see it applied? Um, and what do you perceive as potential or anticipate as potential gaps? Uh, hello. Uh, very quickly, um, I mean, uh, the Commission has signed a specific under, uh, memorandum of understanding with China uh, on uh, subsidies and state aid um, in 2017. Uh, would that be an effective channel uh, to push China, as it was the call from the panel, uh, to address the concerns we have? Another channel could be uh, a more effective uh, response by WTO. Uh, do you find this as a realistic possibility? And finally, um, there was, uh, by Philippe, uh, this call for um, updating competition law by defining a special category of platforms, uh, the structural, relevant, big structural uh, platforms. Um, why this will work better than the dominance, market dominance uh, uh, obligations, the Article 102, and how can we define what are the criteria of these platforms? Thank you. And is there anybody else who would like to ask a question? Yes, then we... Uh Hi, Jacob Perry from PAR. I just wanted to ask about the discussions at the OECD level about con competitive neutrality. How would they intersect with uh, the proposals that are being put forward by DG Comp? But, um, I think a few more because um, we don't have that much time. So the lady here, please. Thank you. Uh, my name is Harriet. I work for Dutch Shipbuilders. Um, so 
one of my conclusions from this meeting is that there is actually no one size fits all also for industry. So that's why the report of this material is very useful because then you have many different industries with many different uh, solutions. I just want to mention um, also because of the white paper which is coming out that uh, we are one of those industries, uh, let's say, mentioned in the China meet in 2005 and mm -hmm. it's a more maybe conservative industry, but we face major state subsidies uh, in China. It, we have this sort of love-hate relationship where China is super important but also uh, very dangerous. On top of that, we have one um, extra problem, which is huge and quite specific for our industry, I'll keep that short, but we lack um, uh, effective trade rules uh, to, um, let's say, react on price dumping. So, uh, Mr. Steinberg, for example, referred to um, mm. trade defense instruments. We cannot use them. They don't apply to our industry. I think uh, from Hong Kong, um, uh, it was referred to OECD. We tried for 50 years to um, uh, negotiate with China uh, for rules in OECD, and we failed. And WTO rules are also not effective. So, one of our major um, requests is to member states, but also to the European Commission, please also make some <coughs> sort of uh, specific sector reference in the white paper to tackle foreign subsidies, because unfortunately, it's not one size fits all. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So the ship industry, indeed, uh, it's the second time I, I heard that comment actually now. Um, the last time was in Berlin uh, by a colleague of yours from the, from the ship industry. I mean, apparently the anti-dumping uh, measures of the w, uh, in the WTO system do not apply to, which I don't know actually about the sector. So it would be an interesting... Don't apply I mean, to if services. That's the issue. So I, I would love to hear yeah. if someone knows yeah. this specific yeah. sector, it, it would be interesting to hear because I, I just don't know. So. Yeah. Uh, is there any last uh, question? Because then we go back to our, our three panelists and per perhaps, Christoph, we, we start with you um, uh, uh, and get the commission views. Uh, yes, maybe I start with the <clears throat> so-called FDI screening regulation that was uh, adopted last year and will be uh, implemented and become effective uh, in October. Um, so how it will work in practice we don't know yet because it's not yet um, being applied by member states um, but it it's, will be part of the whole toolbox of how to deal with uh, foreign uh, investment and of creating uh, more generally a level playing field um, here um, well in contrast to what I've been talking about before it's not based on competition law it's based on public order and public security so the screening criteria will be different um, it will look more into strategic sectors which are also there are examples of it in the regulation um, and the main task of uh, enforcing it will be at national level um, as it's public order and public security for which the subsidiary principle is much stronger to put it in, in well simple terms uh, the national authorities will be in charge um, there may be some overlap with what uh, exists today or will be developed under competition law but I we well that's one of the things we will also address in the white paper to see to what extent there is an unnecessary overlap there may be some uh, overlap that cannot be avoided um, Talking, and I think also reacting to what uh, Alicia said uh, before and to one question on the WTO, I think already today we are very much aware that we need to act at different levels. Um, there is the WTO, well, I will not judge on how effective it is, but I think the EU doesn't want to be seen as the one that um, disregards the WTO. Um, others are doing it and there is a problem with the operation of the WTO but I think it is a uh, policy of the EU and the Commission to try to make the WTO as much as possible and certainly not undermine uh, the rules that are in place so I think there is a push also to reform uh, the WTO. But there are, as mentioned before, there are also trilateral talks on subsidies, more specifically with the US and Japan. So that's another forum on which uh, the level playing field issue is addressed. There is the bilateral investment 
uh, agreement that is being negotiated between the EU and China. Um, but on top of it, and that's been the focus so far on us, there is the idea, do we need a unilateral instrument um, to a defensive instrument com complementing the actions at multilateral level. Um, so just to illustrate, there are many, um, many forums and many levels at which uh, there is an action. Um, on, the, uh, on the specific industries, I think, well, thank you for pointing out the shipbuilding. Actually, we've noticed ourselves also that very specific rules apply to shipbuilding. Um, we are, for example, in the airline sector is another example which is uh, subject to very different rules where interestingly there's already a kind of trade defense instrument specifically for the airline industry uh, into which we've looked. But uh, also when you look at the WTO rules, the rules for product markets are different than for services. They are much more uh, developed for uh, products than they are for services. So it just shows the complexity of the area and of the international obligations under which we are as the and that uh, whatever instrument we may want to develop in the future needs to take into account the specificities. I think also to be realistic, the problem will, the, the instrument that we are working on will not solve all the problems, but I think we want to make it fit as, as uh, well as possible into what's there and, and to address the problems uh, that, that we've, have been highlighted uh, to us. Okay, uh, Luisa. Thank you. Um, on the FDI screening, well, I think, uh, as Christopher was saying, we, we need to see how it's going to be implemented, of course. I think for the European business, the main, the main important thing is to ensure that uh, we have some harmonization within the European Union. Uh, the fact that we don't have uh, countries, or some countries do not have anything in place, is, of course, an issue for us. We will need to see how this is going to... to to work in practice. Of course, we don't want this instrument to be a deterrent for foreign investments. We, we need foreign investments, and this has always been one, one key aspect for us. Um, at the same time, uh, it, would be better, it would be very good to, for Europe to know a little bit better what is happening in this area. Uh, and it's important, of course, that uh, how we use this information that we're going to obtain from, uh, from the system, because basically the screening is kind of a monitoring. Uh, it will allow, of course, to share information and will allow the European Union and also other member states to know what is happening in Europe, and this is important. Uh, we've always been very cautious about ensuring that we have, in many cases, very sensitive information so that this uh, sensitive information is safeguarded. But even so, I think there's plenty of data that can and should also be shared with, uh, with stakeholders uh, to make sure that we have a better knowledge of what is happening in this area. And it's very important, it's always been one aspect for us, that we really use the instrument for uh, public order, and not start using it, you know, uh, for uh, a national security and not for, you know, uh, things like economic strategy or industrial policy. I mean, we think this should be really a, an instrument for bear, to be used uh, in, a, in, a, in a very careful way. Then, on the response by the WTO uh, and using also other, other platforms, of course, we, the WTO is in, is in crisis, we all know that. At the same time, uh, on the rules side, there are things to, that can be done. I mean, we are working on a trilateral level. I think this exercise should be plurilateral, pro, plurilateralized in the sense that we have a number of uh, countries that share the same interests, for instance, Canada, Australia, New Zealand, even countries in Asia and South America. So I think we need to, to build uh, on this exercise that we're doing in the three of us and ensure that more and more share the same uh, idea so we also convince China that this is, a, this is an important issue. On the competitive neutrality is definitely one of the things that we ask also in our paper. Um, and this is a very hot topic in China, actually, because even Chinese SMEs are complaining about the fact that you really don't have fair competition in the, in the market in China because you have so much benefits that are being given to state-owned enterprises 
in detriment of smaller companies. So it's definitely an issue uh, where we would need a, a general response. We know, for instance, Australia, and this is something we are pointing also in our paper, has already the possibility, you know, of a system based on complaints uh, when uh, the operators see that the system is not really working and we don't really have neutral competition in the market. So this could be something that we as Europeans and also other partners could, could look at it. Finally, on dumping, we don't have, uh, the anti-dumping basically applies to goods and trade defense applies to goods. And this is, this is an issue because we're having a lot of unfair competition uh, in some areas that are not covered by, by goods, including on services. Uh, and this will become, will become an issue that we will need to discuss uh, further on. Thank you. So, Philip, and then uh, Alicia, you will have the last word. Well, I think on, on FDI screening, uh, everything uh, has been said. I mean, in Germany, we have already enacted tougher, tougher regulations, specified what actually um, national security interest uh, may be. There have been some, some uh, uh, procedures now initiated, uh, but I totally agree with uh, Luisa, of course. It's, uh, it is really, it's, 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 a, it's an instrument that needs to be used carefully and, uh, and in a, um, a commensurate um, way. Um, I mean, on, on subsidy, subsidies and the, w, the role of the WTO, I mean, yeah, I mean, we all hope for the WTO. I mean, seeing the, 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 the state of, of, of play, I mean, obviously it's, it's, uh, it will probably if, 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 uh, take, take some time. So, so I, this, this shouldn't be, I mean, as much as, of course, we, we, we try to reform it and to, to, to um, improve the, the, the WTO system um, as things stand, um, it shouldn't, we shouldn't place all our hopes in, in, in this. I think that is, uh, that is just a pragmatic reality, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid uh, to, to, to say. Um, well, on, on competitive neutrality, of course, I mean, that's, that's what we are trying to achieve, of course, I mean, with all the difficulties, but the, the, main, the main emphasis, of course, is on competitive uh, uh, new, new, neutrality. Um, we want to clear, create a level playing field um, that uh, state-owned, or at least, I mean, in China it goes very far, I mean, state subsidized companies, that they act, um, act in, a, in, a, in a competitive way. We don't have a problem with, with state-owned companies. We do have those in, in Europe as well, of course, um, uh, um, but, but they should be, behave in a competitive way. Um, on well on structural uh, platforms that uh, I mean um, that's of course one question I mean the, the idea is, 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 is present in, in certain so in, in the discussions I mean the Furman report actually um, um, uh, proposes uh, this I mean there it's I mean they're, they're, of course the, they're different different takes one one can have I mean um, of course what the, I think the underlying question is up to what what can competition policy competition law do and in in what uh, way and what uh, what else do we need what kind of regulatory law, law do we do we need i mean there there have been discussions there are still discussions about a horizontal data law data access law data um, um, regulation uh, law and uh, and of course sectoral laws in, as things stand, but I have to admit that, that, that neither I nor I believe, uh, at least not in the, in the economics ministry, but I think that holds true for the German government as well. We don't have a have a, have have an, uh, an opinion on that. Uh, which, but we we think we should actually update competition law, competition policy as much as possible. And here, um, I think, of course, it is it, it is imperative that we can act. Uh, Quicker that we are, we are more reactive. That we are that we are um, uh, that that we, are, we, we just get um, that our, our competition framework is adapted to the realities of this this complex world. And then we can have sectoral laws, sectoral regulation. Of course, what we need in the, in the vehicle sector, for example, so and of course we will need a, a specific law. Um, but it may be possible as well, of course, to say okay, we, the, our our maybe updated horizontal competition law. Is, is fit enough, and we don't need a special provision for platform structurant for for structurally um, structurally relevant um, uh, uh, platforms. Uh, since the debate on this general data regulation is so is so slow and so complicated, and, and our view is that uh, that the application of competition law is well at least um, very complicated and takes too much time. 
we actually decided to present uh, one proposition uh, to actually um, uh, have, a, a, have a provision for structurally relevant uh, platforms uh, where we actually hope to be quicker, to, be, to, to, to have more precise rules already in our competition law without it being regulatory law. But that's certainly not the only, uh, only um, possibility, but it's something, I mean, which, uh, I mean, you have to solve the problem one way or the other. That's, that's our main, main message. Okay, uh, Alicia, I don't know whether we lost you now, but if you, <laughs> if you, uh, no, here you are. Uh, so, so if you have uh, one last uh, quick comment before we go for the lunch break. Yes, very briefly, because it's, there were so many questions, I only want to focus on competitive neutrality because we've been working on this topic for too long. Um, so I understand that this, this is a key concept, or so I hear, uh, in our bilateral discussions with China, but I just want to, and, and the hope would be that, you know, we could measure the degree of um, distortions, uh, which SOEs or other protected companies uh, may be creating, not only in China, but, you know, in global markets. So that's kind of the idea that we would like to, to pursue. But I have to say that that while there was a little bit of a you know, hype on this concept at the beginning of the negotiations with the U.S., so pre-collapse uh, of negotiations in May last year, um, it seems what I hear is that you know the Chinese are not comfortable because of more of a of a ideological reason, meaning this is an imported concept which doesn't reflect uh, Chinese reality. And when you hear how they interpret uh, this competitive neutrality, they basically change it into something which is more like private companies should also help create employment, social responsibility, you know, like kind of um, share the burden of an harmonious society, economically speaking. So, you know, when you hear that and, and you see where we're coming from, in a way, I understand the U.S. dropping the whole thing and saying, you know, if that's what you mean, maybe we're not interested. And I'm just saying that that I just want to tone down the the expectations, let alone the fact that we don't know how to measure it. And 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 this is the attempt we, we were trying to to achieve in, in this um calculations for Bruegel, which were looking at basically effective tax ratio and uh, interest payments for a unit of debt being very different, both lower, obviously, for SOEs in every sector but one in China. So that was our finding. But the thing is, once you find it, you so what? I mean, uh, maybe they create less employment, maybe they are not as nice to their employees, you know what I mean? Like, like literally, it gets diluted into what is an understanding of why SOEs exist. And in that regard, I think we need to, again, my, my, my message here was that, that operationalizing our needs in a bilateral negotiations might be very, very, very difficult at this stage. I don't think the US has achieved anything but 200 billion in imports from China, frankly speaking in phase one. So I doubt we're going to achieve uh, much more in our bilateral negotiations for the BIT. That's my final word. Okay, thank you very much uh, to all of our panelists, uh, Luisa, Christoph, Philip, and Alicia. Thank you. That was a very inspiring discussion. And to all the online listeners, thank you very much for listening. We had uh, well over 100 people all the time on the webpage uh, listening. Uh, you, you also deserve a lunch break, but you have to get the food yourself while we have some food here outside and we resume at one o'clock. Thank you. Bye-bye. <laughs>